good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Victor Papacosmo, I'm a member of the Department of History and also director of the Lemons Center for NATO and European uh, Community Studies, and I'd like to welcome you. The University Artists Lecture share Series for this ac academic year has the theme of the ways we are, diversity at home and abroad. We can undoubtedly all agree from the beginning that the dimensions of diversity are many, sensitive, and multifaceted and demand exposition. The crisis and carnage in the former Yugoslavia today is reflective of perhaps the most extreme and barbaric approach to dealing with the problems of ethnic diversity. In effect, the forceful elimination of diversity's presence as each of the three parties in this complex triangular struggle of shifting unwritten alliances sanitizes areas falling under its control. In this context, one can also reflect on the old adage that my enemy's enemy is my friend, with the added opportunistic proviso that the friend of the moment can be the enemy of the future, once the present enemy is disposed of. The new world order is, regrettably, a messy world order, with an awful lot of older pre-Cold War patterns resurfacing in virulent form. Attempts at containing these brutal tendencies have had limited success. One has but to listen to the evening news to arrive at this conclusion. The United Nations has had the difficult charge of providing peacekeeping missions to many troubled areas since 1948. Our speaker this evening, G Major General Lewis McKenzie, is a veteran of nine such missions, most recently as head of the UN contingents in Sarajevo. He is certainly in a position to describe the formidable challenges confronting such missions, problems which appear even more formidable during this so-called New World Order. Joe McKenzie is a native of Nova Scotia and the son of a career soldier. After graduation from high school, he joined the Army, rising quickly in rank. Because of Canada's traditionally strong participatory role in UN observer and peacekeeping missions, General McKenzie acquired considerable experience in these special international assignments. His first stint with a Canadian force on UN mission came in 1963 in the Gaza Strip. Subsequent UN assignments took him to hotspots such as Cyprus for three times, Libya, Nicaragua, Egypt, and Vietnam. In late February 1992, he was appointed Chief of Staff to the UN forces in Yugoslavia arriving in Sarajevo in early March, one, more, one month before fighting broke out in Bosnia, and staying until early August. He then returned to Canada and assumed the command of Ontario's land forces. He retired from the military earlier this year, included among his avocations, his competition racing in his Formula Ford. The several co-sponsors of this evening's program are well aware of the many controversial issues that will be addressed. The university, it must be borne in mind, traditionally provides an open, uh, an open forum for the airing of disputatious topics. The problems surrounding the former Yugoslavia are one such subject. Not all attendees were in agreement with the views expressed in November 1991 when we had a representative of the Croatian government speak on war in Croatia, geopolitical considerations. And also this past February, when we had a lecturer of Muslim and Jewish background from Sarajevo talk on Sarajevo before and after tragedy. Assuredly, there will be a similar response by some members of the audience this evening. I'd like to welcome um, General Lewis McKenzie, who will speak on diversity and peacekeeping in the new world order. Thank you. I'd like to wander around, but I'll stay here if you like. I probably should be able to come up with some sort of a half-decent presentation tonight because I just had a meal. Now, you might wonder what the connection is. 39 of 40 nights, I've spoken for my dinner. Uh, 20 of those days, I spoke for my lunch. I developed a conditioned reflex. Uh, Pavlov's dog drooled when he heard the bell ring. When I smell food, I talk about Sarajevo. 
<laughs> on the one night that I didn't speak for my dinner, I took my wife out to McDonald's on Finch Avenue in Toronto. And halfway through, a Big Mac stood up and gave an unsolicited presentation on Sarajevo. I normally get in well into the presentation before I talk about propaganda, media hype, vilification of the UN and myself. But I thought tonight, just to put it in context, that I'd probably better explain to the audience that you're not listening to someone who has taken a particular side in the conflict because you would probably think that by what you're hearing and what you're seeing. Let me tell you how this works and why countries will probably be reluctant to volunteer their senior military officers to command UN missions in the field in the future. Because it's a little bit interesting that I left Bosnia primarily because I'd lost all credibility with the Bosnian government, and my dear friend Philippe Morion left because he'd lost all credibility with the Bosnian Serbs. There is an impossibility to maintain any type of perception of impartiality when you defy the UN's own charter. And that charter, to paraphrase, says, don't get involved in a civil war. Now, Bosnia is a civil conflict with overtones of aggression from two neighboring countries. But for all intents and purposes, and it has been accepted by the international community, don't take my word for it, it is a civil conflict. And therefore, in April of this year, one of your own elected members of the United States Congress approached an agent in Washington and asked me to come to Washington, address the House of Representatives, and also to speak to the Heritage Foundation, a very fairly conservative think tank in Washington. <clears throat> The American agent contacted my agent in, in Toronto, and a contract was arranged, and I went to Washington and made the presentation. It was my standard presentation that you'll hear tonight, so you can pass judgment on the content. About two weeks later, someone phoned Newsday in New York and indicated that Serbnet, a Serbian media watch group, had paid for the trip to Washington. And I asked for written confirmation of that. I subsequently discovered from your member of Congress that in actual fact, Serbnet had underwritten most of the cost of the trip, at which time I gave the money to AIDS research in Canada. But coming out of that is a continuing and fairly sophisticated uh, campaign that Mackenzie is a Serbian agent. I assure you, I left Bosnia disliking all sides in the conflict. I was truly impartial. They all pissed me off. And I was most upset that anybody could treat the other two ethnic groups the way that they treated each other. And I, with that groundwork, and I will get into more of this media campaign, uh, which, funnily enough, if you do get involved in a civil conflict, just remember, unlike your own here in America, hire a good PR company. Make sure you've got good media folks advising you, because it's very important to get your 15-second soundbite on television every night showing that you're the good guys and the other people are the bad guys. Let's talk a little bit about peacekeeping. Not a bad idea to have a Canadian here to talk to you about it because egotistically, my nation's been taking credit for this ever since 1947-48 when it all began. It's really egotistical for us to do that because it was done for national self-interest, big time self-interest. If you and the Soviet Union went to war, you wouldn't fight it in America and you wouldn't fight it in Russia. You'd fight it over top of Toronto, and Winnipeg, and Vancouver. That's where the missiles would meet. And so it was in Canada's self-interest that we got involved in peacekeeping early on. And our objective was to reduce the level of tension between the two world's superpowers. So let's get that out of the way. And from 1948, when the first force went into the Middle East as UNSO, the United Nations Truth Supervisory Organization, right through until 1992, 
Peacekeeping was a grammatically correct term. There was a peace to keep. Those of you who are familiar with hockey, think of it as a fight. You ever notice that hockey players always get into a fight somewhere close to the referee? That's because they really don't want to fight. It's this macho thing to do in front of a large audience. And you want to make sure that as soon as possible, somebody's going to step in and stop it. War is a little bit like that. And therefore, when the two sides, and normally it was two sides, it was a war of aggression, one country invading the other, when they got tired, they turned to the UN, the UN sent in a peacekeeping force, the sides separated, and these folks in white vehicles with blue berets arrived in the middle to provide the convenient macho excuse to stop fighting. And it worked, except for a few notable exceptions in the Congo in 1956 when they had to fight their way out, Cyprus in 1974, when the, uh, the Turks, depending on your point of view, intervened or invaded Cyprus, and some nasty situations in Beirut, particularly southern Lebanon. The rest of the time, the other 33 missions were pretty peaceful stuff. As someone who served in a lot of them, you were maybe scared once every two months. The rest of the time was pretty good. It was enjoyable soldiering, and it gave you bragging rights when you came home. All that changed big time in Sarajevo. And it wasn't premeditated. It happened because of four people, of which one is here talking to you now, and I'll get to that. It wasn't a decision by the Security Council. When Yugoslavia started to self-destruct in 1991, and Slovenia and Croatia declared their independence, and the international community recognized them, what was left of Serbia and the JNA, the Yugoslavian National Army, invaded into Croatia saying that they were defending the Serbian minorities in southern Croatia. You don't have to accept that. That's why they went into southern Croatia, to protect their Serbian minorities. Mr. Vance arrives on the scene, your distinguished American diplomat in November of 1991. He puts together a conventional peacekeeping plan. 14,000 UN troops would arrive in southern Croatia and protect the minorities in the United Nations protected areas, mainly Serbian minorities within Croatia. That's the plan that the international community made, led, or at least orchestrated, put together by, by Mr. Vance. Now, the UN does not move at the speed of light. This plan was put together in November 1991. In the first week of March 1992, yours truly and 23 other individuals representing approximately 15 nations from around the world arrive in New York to put together the plan to put the 14,000 troops in Croatia. It would take an army staff of a couple of hundred, about six months to do that. We were given 48 hours. Half of us spoke, spoke English or French. In fact, two of us put the plan together in eight hours. And we went off over one objection. At that stage, I'd been in the Army for 32 years, and I thought I knew just about everything as far as an Army was concerned. And I got a little uneasy when we were told to put our headquarters 350 kilometers of the front line, 350 kilometers ahead of the front line in Sarajevo, even though the operation that we were going there to command was in Croatia. But it was explained to us by the diplomats that things were a little tense in Sarajevo, and therefore perhaps the presence of 250 staff officers and 50 conscript Swedish soldiers would cool things down. Our response was that as soon as we put our UN flag up in Sarajevo, it'll be a lightning rod for every problem in Bosnia, but we were overruled. And we were soldiers, you do what you're told. We went to Sarajevo, things were tense, the roads were occasionally blockaded as a result of a, uh, a killing that happened over the Christmas period at a wedding, and various ethnic groups were blockading their areas during nighttime only. Over the next couple of weeks, rumors circulated that the European community would recognize Bosnia as an independent nation on the 6th of April of last year. Now, a whole bunch of dumb soldiers, led by number one dumb, goes back to his country, and they went back to probably about 20 of the 31 nations there saying, don't recognize Bosnia. 
If you do, there will be fighting. Now, we didn't give them a lot of warning, only three weeks, and they ignored us because the international community can't react that quickly. And so we did what soldiers do very well. We started a pool. Throw in five bucks and guess when the war is going to start. And one of my majors won a lot of money for picking 2.30 in the afternoon of the 5th of April. It didn't take a PhD in political science. It didn't take 20 years in a diplomatic service to see this coming. It was plain as the nose in your face. And a lot of people in Sarajevo knew about it a long time before we did. Now, when the war started, we had an interesting situation on our hands. We had 300 soldiers in Sarajevo running the operation in Croatia, but we had no mandate. No mandate for Bosnia. It was never intended that the UN would ever have a mandate in Bosnia when the original plan was put together. If I sent a soldier downtown Sarajevo and he was killed, I was legally responsible. No mandate. Not only that, we couldn't talk to the 14,000 soldiers in Croatia under our command who had no resupply, no food, no water, no communications, no spares, no maintenance, no vehicles, and wondered what the hell we were doing in Sarajevo because they couldn't talk to us. This is not my idea of an efficient military organization. And, say, and so over the next two or three weeks, as the situation began to deteriorate, it became necessary for us to leave. Now that was long after the European community, the European Community Military Monitors, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the International Red Cross, and the diplomatic community had all left. So we picked up 200 of our 300 and we went to Belgrade. Why Belgrade? Because our job was to manage the withdrawal of the JNA from southern Croatia. And we left a hundred soldiers there to take on humanitarian activities because they were dealing with evacuating hospitals and exchanging bodies. Except we were beginning to notice something that we'd never seen on peacekeeping before. Whenever we helped one side, the other side accused us of collaboration. In other words, if you had a vehicle full of Muslim casualties, then the Serbs would stop you at gunpoint and say, put them in the ditch and load our casualties and take them to the hospital. If there were Serbian casualties, the Muslims would do the same thing. Each side saw you as a tool for their side, but couldn't accept that you were helping both sides because you were there as impartial, objective observers. It didn't matter whether you liked that or not. That is the job that the international community through the Security Council gave you. And that's the job that you were there to execute. So we went to, we went to Belgrade, and there's about well, there are four of us sitting around the coffee table in my boss's office in Belgrade, General Nambiar, outstanding officer, much maligned in the press, quit and went back to India because he was so frustrated with the UN. Cedric Thornberry, who you've all seen probably on CNN a couple of weeks ago leading a convoy in the Mostar. Philippe Morion, a name that I'm sure you all know, uh, who was the deputy commander of the force and myself. And we said, look, we told the UN not to send us into Sarajevo. They did over our objections. We've been professionally embarrassed because now the whole world thinks we've abandoned Sarajevo even though we never had any job there in the first place. How do we get back? Well, why don't we go to the Serbs? Let's go to the Bosnian Serbs. They're being portrayed as the lepers of the international community. Let's use that. Let's say to them, look, why don't you give us the airport in Sarajevo? We'll open it, we'll bring in food and medicine, and we'll show the world that you're not 100% to blame in this particular thing. And it worked. It was agreed. We could take the airport. So I asked for volunteers, remember, no mandate. You can't order anybody to go to Sarajevo. They came there to run the operation in Croatia. So you ask for volunteers and you get 16. 16 volunteers to go back to Sarajevo. So it's about a six hour drive normally. It took three days. Kidnapping, hostage taking, stole our vehicles, threatened. I mean, all the standard nice Sunday afternoon drive stuff of beautiful downtown Balkans. I mean, this is what it's like. You're there to try and help, and this is the way you're treated. But you understand that. So you get into Sarajevo, and you work out a deal with Dr. Karadic to take over the airport on the 28th of June. 
And on the 27th of June at 8.30 in the evening, you get a phone call, very strong French accent. General McKenzie, yes. The President of France will arrive at the airport in an hour and 30 minutes. Now, when you get a crank call like that in Canada, it's normally a drunk on a Friday night trying to get you to do something really stupid. So you get the individual's number, you call him back to confirm he is who he says he is, but we couldn't do that. Telephone communication in and out of Sarajevo wasn't that great. So I said to this individual, who turned out to be Minister Kushner, the Minister of Health and Humanitarian Relief for, for France, I said, please tell President Mitterrand there's a major tank battle going on in the airport right now. There are three wrecked cars in the runway. There's shrapnel all over the runway, any piece of which will cut the president's tire, pitch him off the runway into the minefields that run parallel to the runway. There are about 300 Claymore mines, nasty little devices with 1,500 jagged ball bearings in front of plastic explosives sitting aimed at the runway, and I know the command detonation device is in the tower. There are mountains on two sides of the runway. It'll be dark in an hour. I have no lights. I have no radar. And other than that, I'd love to see the president of France. <laughs> and the voice said, the president will arrive in an hour and 20 minutes. Something happened then as a professional soldier that I'll always remember and be very proud of, proud of on the behalf of France. Because by that time, my Swedish soldiers had been replaced by French Marine commandos. And I called them together because this is what generals dream of. If they don't, they shouldn't be generals. I mean, there's no colonels there or majors. I mean, it's a general and a bunch of soldiers. And I explained to them in my very bad Canadian French, your president's arriving in an hour and 15 minutes. I'm going to take you to the airport if we can get there. You're going to sweep the runway by hand. The UN and its generosity has given us six armored personnel carriers for 300 people. Two of them are going in the minefield at the front of the runway, two at the back, and two at where I think your president will want to touch down. When he comes over the horizon, we're going to flick on the lights and pray he doesn't splatter himself on the side of a mountain. You would have thought I was asking these French soldiers to go for a shopping spree. I mean, dead keen, couldn't have cared less, going to risk their life. So I had a Russian and a colonel deputy, uh, sorry, a Russian and an Australian uh, deputy in the op center. And I turned to the Australian and I said, John, what if this was the Prime Minister of Australia coming in here? And these were Australian soldiers. What do you think their reaction would be? And his re remarks are not repeatable in this audience. <laughs> there was a Canadian captain over in the corner who volunteered his opinion as to what Canadian soldiers would do if this was Prime Minister Mulroney at the time coming to visit. <laughs> but these French soldiers, dead keen. To make a long story short, we tried to talk Mitterrand out of coming that night, and he said he'd arrive at 8.30 the next morning by fixed-wing aircraft. That's army for a plane with wings on it as opposed to a blade. And I took the French soldiers out there the next morning, 16 steel helmets full of shrapnel they picked up. We stood there like idiots at 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, and 11.30, President Mitterrand arrived by helicopter, which I was quite happy with. He did get hit with a a 12.7 millimeter slug on the way in, but it didn't knock the helicopter out of the sky. Here's an interesting spin on peacekeeping. He was coming in as a representative of France. Nobody else in the European community knew he was arriving. He had phoned Boutrous Galli. Boutrous Galli had phoned me after Mitterrand had phoned. And he was just going to see the legitimate president of Bosnia, President Tabegovic. And I said, <coughs> You can't do that to me, Mr. President. We're here as an impartial peacekeeping force. We might not like it, but this is what the Security Council, of which you're a part, has sent us here to do. You've got to see Karadich. You've got to see both sides in this conflict. And this is where you start getting painted as a Serbian, paid Serbian agent, which is so ridiculous. That's how peacekeeping works. You negotiate in this country, you negotiate in my country, you do it by talking to all sides in the conflict. You don't talk about the 13th century. And he said, I'll meet him for five minutes at the airport. And I said, no, actually, we'll meet him for an hour. He said, no, I'll meet him for five minutes. And I said, I'm not telling you you're going to meet him for an hour. It will happen that way. Two minutes after you start your meeting with him, it will be what I call showtime in Sarajevo. There will be an orchestrated battle that will be so violent it will keep you wherever you are for at least an hour. I was out by 30 seconds. He said hello to Dr. Karadich. Two and a half minutes later, 
the tanks, the artillery, the snipers from Butmir, Dobrynya, Sarajevo, surrounding areas all opened up and he had a 55 minute meeting with Dr. Karadich until the fighting stopped. During that meeting, casualties were dragged in. Casualties, one of which had his arm blown off. They were presented to President Mitterrand as people who had sacrificed their lives and their limbs for the President of France. I asked my medical advisor from the United Kingdom after President Mitterrand had left, how old were the casualties? By that I mean how old were the wounds? None of them were fresher than three hours. This was a tactic used by both sides, all three sides in fact now, or four sides. Hold people without medication, use them as props for CNN to portray your particular case in your favor on the international media. Before Mitterrand left, he did something that no other VIP had done before and we got a, or after, and we got a lot of them after he left. He said, what can I do for you? He said, well, Mr. President, uh, if you hadn't have visited, we would have taken over the airport today. We can't because of the fighting. But pilots aren't brain dead. When we took over the airport today, nobody would fly in. It's too dangerous. If you send two French aircraft, just two, tomorrow, it'll so embarrass the rest of the world to be queued up. Now, Mitterrand's called a sphinx. There's no facial reaction. You don't know whether he's understanding, he's listening, hearing, remembering, whatever. Believe you me, he is. 8.30 the next morning, two C-160 Transals dropped out of the sky. French aircraft, one full of water. We didn't need water. Sarajevo didn't need water. It didn't matter. It was a humanitarian delivery. The other one had the American revenge on the Muslim diet, a thing called MREs, meals ready to eat. <laughs> it didn't matter that it wasn't appropriate because it kick-started the operation. Within 24 hours, 36 nations were queued up, prepared to send planes to Zagreb, there was an embargo against uh, Belgrade at that time, ready to fly in aid, and the operation was started. Now at that stage, the Security Council at ambassadorial level met and authorized the release of the Canadian battalion from Derivar in Croatia to come to Sarajevo. Why the Canadian battalion? It had nothing to do with me. I was a UN officer at the stage. But the UN in its wisdom, still thinking peacekeeping, had told the battalions of 850 men they were only allowed to bring 15 armored personnel carriers each. It's cheated, they brought 80, but they had wheels on them, so they called them armored trucks. Canada brought 83, but they were M113 armored personnel carriers, American style APCs, and we got caught. We needed those APCs. We needed them big time. I wanted to bring a large anti-tank weapon. I had to defend the airport, so the Serbs had a lot of tanks over in Lukovica. It would have been nice to have an anti-tank weapon. The UN, in its wisdom, thinking peacekeeping, said you can bring the anti-tank weapon system for the night vision, but you're not allowed to bring the missiles. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. What about mortars? Yeah, you can bring illuminating, but you can't bring high explosives. So we cheated. And nobody should ever obey an order that's stupid. So we ignored it. And I'm getting towards the point where the UN has to grow into its new responsibility. Now, I'm only taking a couple of minutes to tell you why Canadians are good at this work. Because it relates to something I'm going to say about Americans shortly. Canadians are good at this work, but not for the reason you might think. We all pat ourselves in the back and we're sore from doing that because we're such great peacekeepers because we're the best soldiers in the world. No, we're not. On any day of the week, hopefully you're in the top five, and we're pretty damn good. But it's got nothing to do with our soldierly skills. There are tons of good soldiers around the world. Remember that. It's the fluke of birth or the fluke of nationality if you're an immigrant. We don't have any territorial ambitions in our country. We can't even look after what we've got, okay? Second largest country in the world. We don't need any more territory. Please don't give us a thing. We have never gone abroad with our flag We've done a little bit within the borders, perhaps with the native population, but we've never gone abroad and jabbed our flag into the ground and said, this is ours, we're taking it. Our foreign aid program 
It's seen as very even-handed. We never humiliate people when we give them something. We slide a million under the table and say, please take it. It's from Canada. Don't, don't say thank you, just take it. I mean, it's something to be proud of. It's our characteristic. And when you combine that with good soldiers, you get a synergy that makes us excellent peacekeepers because we're trained to kill. A lot of people don't like to hear that. A lot of Canadians thought that peacekeeping, and I use this in a positive sense, were boy scouts going around the world helping old ladies across the street. That's not what it is. It's dangerous, messy, thankless business. But there are only certain nations cut out to do it. As I was driving down to President Itzabegovich's office shortly after the Canadians arrived, I thought I saw my name on a telephone pole, on a piece of paper. So I pulled my armored car up. I always, being a sports car fanatic, I did my own driving, had my driver sit beside me and read, Mackenzie's married to a Serb. And he was introduced to her by Mila Mulrooney. Now, you know, reason why you should know, but Mila Mulrooney was the wife of our prime minister at the time. She was born in Sarajevo and left at four years of age. So she started her terrorist career fairly, fairly early. <laughs> and this innuendo started to circulate. And in the good old days, when you left the operational theater, you left it behind you. This is not the case anymore. You bring it with you. And that's why volunteers are drying up. When our friend Herak was quite rightly court-martialed down in Sarajevo for slaughtering Muslim women, he indicated that General McKenzie used to drop by Sonia's camp north of Sarajevo and pick up four Muslim women at a time, rape them and murder and leave them in the ditch. Now, the fact that we couldn't get out of Sarajevo the fact that our mandate didn't expand to Sarajevo and the fact that he said I did this in August and I left on the 31st of July didn't matter. It captured the imagination of the Islamic conference in Riyadh on the day the story was broken. And then the Bosnian judiciary wrote a letter addressed to Boutrous Ghali asking for my immunity to be lifted so I could be tried as a war criminal. The letter was sent to every media outlet in the world but never sent to the UN because it's part of a campaign orchestrated by a North American-based media company. Isn't that interesting? When you get involved in a civil conflict, don't hire one of your own. Hire the folks in North America. They're really good at this. So this is the type of thing that commanders will have to live with in the future if you can convince your family to put up with it. But it's very, very effective, and ladies and gentlemen, if I was in their shoes, I'd do the same thing. I'm a soldier. I'll do anything to win if that's what you told me to do. It's just unfortunate that people have to start believing this stuff. By the way, my wife's a McKinnon. I've started calling her McKinnovich. <laughs> just to make sure it fits. Now, if you think the direction of peacekeeping changed in Sarajevo, it changed big time in Somalia and completed the turn. Now, I'd like to think we went to Somalia because governments had rational decisions or discussions and, and come up, came up with recommendations and forwarded them to the General Assembly. There was a debate and it went to the Security Council and a whole bunch of great folks sat around and came up with recommendations. And you led a coalition force that went to Somalia. Baloney. You went to Somalia because of the pictures on the late news. It was a living example of television driving foreign policy. More people were dying in the southern Sudan and Liberia and Angola and Mozambique. Some of them from natural causes as opposed to civil war induced famine. But we rushed into Somalia, into a relatively isolated area of Somalia, in fact, because the whole country wasn't undergoing the sort of problems that they had southwest of Mogadishu. I know because I was preparing a battalion to go in early on as part of the UN peacekeeping force. And the area we were going to in northern Somalia was in fact relatively tranquil and crops were being planted and brought in. And when you called us and said, hey, we're going in under chapter seven of the charter, Korea, the Gulf, Somalia, the only three chapter seven operations of any significance the UN has taken on since 1945, that means war fighting, not what your administration and your media keeps reporting a peacekeeping mission, it wasn't. 
It was to go in there and rid the country of anarchy, thereby creating the conditions for the delivery of humanitarian aid. The first stage was kicking butt and getting rid of anarchy in Somalia. And your president at the time wisely said, when we have done that, we will leave. And we said, we'll leave with you. And the other 28 nations, most of them said the same thing. When it came time for you to leave, the UN came on bended knee and said, really sorry, we can't seem to generate enough volunteers from other nations around the world to take over from you. Would you please leave some combat troops behind? And out of the goodness of your heart, you said yes. But they won't report to the UN. They'll report to Washington. And when they got in trouble, you sent rangers who report to the Pentagon. So three folks worried about the sky in a 10-city block area in Mogadishu. Any soldier will tell you it's fraught with disaster. But you got sucked in because the UN couldn't pull its weight when it came time. Now, when we criticize the UN, we criticize ourselves. It's the sum of its parts, et cetera, et cetera. But at that particular moment in time, you got involved up to here. Because your soldiers should not be involved on line of confrontation duty in UN peacekeeping. You subject them to a degree of risk much, much greater than any other nation's soldiers in the world. Let me tell you why. If I was a warlord in downtown Mogadishu today and not General Adid, I'd be killing every American soldier I could. Everyone. And I'd pay 75 bucks for a little transmitter, and I'd say, this is General Adid's radio station. I'm going to keep killing Americans. And then, because you can do something about it, which is something no other nation can, you can project fire, uh, power, you will go in and kick a deed's butt. And when you leave, thank you very much, I'll take over. The same thing will happen in Bosnia. I think by the criteria written by your president, you've already decided you're not going into Bosnia, but in the unlikely event that you send 25,000 troops in as part of the peacekeeping force to oversee the Geneva Agreement, if the Serbs don't kill you, the Muslims will and make it look like the Serbs. If the Muslims don't kill you, the Serbs will. If the Serbs don't kill you, the Croats will and make it look like the Muslims. You will be killed because everybody wants you there on their side. It's a civil conflict. There'll be all kinds of people disagreeing with me on that, but the world has painted it as a civil conflict and you will be sucked in to one side. You think you're going to have a face-to-face -face confrontation with the Serbs, the Bosnians, or, or sorry, the Muslims or the Croats? As I said in front of your Senate committee, it's an American convoy coming down the road in northern Bosnia. There's one person standing on the road, and your young captain speaks to that individual, and the individual says, they, the other side, has 20 of my family hanging by their heels from a tree just over the hill. If you take one more step down this road, I've been told to tell you they will cut a throat for every inch you drive in the direction of Sarajevo. Your young captain's got three choices. Put his tail between his legs and bugger off to the rear. Say the hell with you and start driving and let them cut. Or do something about it. And as Americans, you'll do something about it. Welcome to the Balkans. Welcome to it right up to here. Now, if you want that, that's fine. But you should be aware before you go, it's not going to be a nice, clean, smart weapon type of conflict. It's going to be messy, and they're particularly good at it. And they're particularly good at orchestrating events to make it look like the other side's to blame. And so Somalia and Bosnia, I hope, are litmus cases. Let me insult you before I compliment you. The Vietnam War was an extremely important part of your history. It took your army from one that was struggling to probably the best army in the world, certainly the one most capable of carrying out large operations. I hope that Bosnia and Somalia are defining moments for the United Nations because if they don't do it, you're going to have to, by default. And contrary to what the media says, I don't think you want to do it. I don't think you want to be the world's policeman because nobody's going to win at this game except an improved UN.
The Security Council was designed for the world in 1945. It was the winners. America, China, Russia, France, England. I mean, they were going to be the policemen of the world. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers, thousands of aircraft, hundreds of ships, and the atomic bomb. They were going to be pretty powerful. Isn't it funny? The veto came along. They haven't been able to do their job until last year, or I guess three years ago. But now the world's changed. And quite frankly, four-fifths of the world, developing, third world, isn't too happy with a bunch of white folks from the West running the world's police force. Because China's worried about China and Russia's worried about Russia. We're talking America, France, and England. You're deciding what's happening in the Security Council. The other 10 members rotate through. That's relatively uncomfortable feeling even to some of your friends. The Security Council needs a serious look at. Now, people have said, well, Germany and Japan are going to join. So, ah, so it's the balance in your bank account that dictates whether you're a member of the Security Council. What about people like India and Brazil who have been supporting peacekeeping operations and sacrificing lives around the world since 1948? Well, something to consider. There is no military command and control in the UN. I'm the guy that got in a lot of trouble while I was in uniform for saying, don't phone the UN after 5 o'clock on the weekdays and don't phone them on the weekend. There's no one to answer. And I'm sorry that I had to embarrass them by saying that. A month later, they had a modest operations center with duty officers in it, but no commander. There's a requirement for a military council. And quite frankly, the military councils should consist of people in direct proportion to their contribution on the ground. I was really upset as a Canadian that my ambassador had to sneak in the back door of the Security Council to say, bombing serve positions is really a dumb thing while there are peacekeepers on the ground. Why should the Chinese and the Russians debate that for me? Thank you very much. We had over 2,500 Canadians there for the last 18 months in Croatia and Bosnia. We've earned our right to participate in the debate. People who are making decisions like that, including your president, should have troops on the ground to wear the consequence before they get involved in the debate. And every time in Geneva that it came time to sign a document as distasteful as it was, is, to split Bosnia into three, the best of really bad solutions, your president would issue another threat. We'll bomb will intervene. Exactly what President Itzabegovic wanted, that's what I'd want. That's what he's been begging for, Western intervention led by the Americans. And he'd get up and he'd walk away from the table and go back to Sarajevo. And they still haven't signed. And the killing continues. Only it's getting worse and more complicated. You need a scorecard. Now the Muslims in Bihash are fighting the Muslims in Sarajevo. Now the Croatians are fighting the Muslims, except in some areas where they're allies. It gets a little complicated. And it's getting worse. And so in conclusion, there are a lot of countries around the world that are broke, a lot of countries with military forces that have no job, and a significant number of them look upon UN peacekeeping as pretty good work. Every UN soldier that goes on UN peacekeeping, his home country receives $1,000 US per month for his services plus rental for all the vehicles. Now that being the case, there are some folks that are volunteering for UN duty that are not there for higher moral causes. I mentioned that you shouldn't get involved in line of confrontation stuff in peacekeeping. You hold the solution for the UN's two major problems. The UN has no logistics. It's arranged by civilian contract to the lowest bidder, it takes four to five months. That's fine in peacekeeping, it's not good enough in war fighting. The UN has no command and control. It doesn't have adequate communications. It has no intelligence. It has no imagery. You do all of those things better than anybody else in the world. You're not paying your bills at the UN. If I was you, I wouldn't pay them either. You know how the money's being, let's be kind, misspent by some of the departments. If you provided the logistics, if you provided the strategic lift, if you provided the imagery, you'd have an audit trail. It would be better than anybody else in the world, and you'd know where your money's being spent because you'd be given it in kind. And there is your major contribution, other than getting into the General Assembly with a big stick and getting some of these nations who have been sitting on their hands for the last 40-some years and not participating to get off their butts 
and do some of the international policing. And you of all the countries can probably wield an economic lever to have them do that. Isn't it funny that in Somalia, no one's mentioned the OAU, the Organization of African Unity? It's in their charter to contribute to peace in Africa, but they're asking you to do it? I mean, that begs the question, what about these regional alliances? What about some of these regional superpowers? Isn't it time they started pulling their weight? Because if you don't light the fire under them, you're going to do it. And you're going to do it by default. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, hopefully I've given you some food for the question period. I look forward to some stimulating questions. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned the National Security Council a couple of times. I have in front of me um, this paper that says that the Croatian-Americans met with um, Alexander Birchbaugh, Deputy Assistant to the Secretary of State, and Janone Walker, Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director of the European Affairs at the National Security Council. Now, over here, additional comments by Walker revealed the need for Croatian-Americans to strengthen their alliance with Catholic organizations on both the local and national level in order to impress upon the administration the strength of the Croatian voting bloc. As a patriotic American, this scares me. As a person that believes in truth and justice, that if you keep on fighting, that maybe the truth will out. I don't like to see this where it says that 60 million Catholics in the United States would, would be able to influence a national security council. Yeah, ma'am, I'm sorry. I, I threw out the term uh, Security Council referring to the United Nations Security Council. I would never think of interfere with the organization of your executive branch. Uh, but, but let me say that... i got to refer to a, a book I mentioned earlier. I mean, uh, Toffler just published a book on the 25th of October, Future Shock and Third Wave by Ian Heidi. His wife, they put out a thing called War and Anti-War. And, uh, and what he's saying is that into the next century, uh, nations and nation states will just be one of a whole bunch of groups that are, that are playing on the world stage and impacting on policy, one of which will be religion, holding groups together, ethnicity, if that's the word, holding groups together, corporations, etc., etc. It's going to be a lot more than just nations, because what we're seeing now is the Third World War, in my field. The world is self-destructing, and a lot of these nations that are redefining their agendas and borders pop out as being economically totally basket cases, which further aggravates. So it doesn't surprise me that groups abroad will attempt to lobby using religion as the epoxy group to hold a particular lobby group together in the United States. But somehow I think that your record is that you'll survive that quite well. Thank you very much. I mean, you, uh, like Canadian, you write letters to editors, and you come to presentations like this. You don't kill your neighbor's children because they're the wrong group. Come on, please. Tough question. Yes, I'd like to ask you one. Yes. Uh, John McKenzie, as a military man, I'm sure you should be able to distinguish between a war and a slaughter. Shouldn't you? You were there in Sarajevo. You saw the Serbian might, artillery position, right on the top of the hills, mm -hmm. and the helpless Sarajevo down below. So, which is it? Slaughter or a war? For war, you have to have two armies. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the way I see it, I'll be happy to answer that. If it was not. <laughs> now, I'm going to answer you as someone impartial and objective. The two two aspects that got me in trouble a lot. If it was, if it was a slaughter, of women over 18 months ago, Sarajevo would have fallen. I personally handed over the vast majority of the of the JNA's equipment to the Bosnian army in Sarajevo. That was part of the deal that they would allow the Serbs to go back to uh, to Serbia. As you know, they get ambushed and used and a bunch of things like that. But I'm just telling you, there's lots of weapons in Sarajevo, and the Bosnian army is doing a very good job of defending. Maybe I better go and stand in the middle here. It seems to be ethnically divided. <laughs> and the Serbs miscalculate. They miscalculate. 
they, they started to shell Sarajevo. When I say shell, it's different from bombardment. Bombardment is using everything they have and wiping the city off the face of the map. They show about around every 30 or 40 seconds in the, on the 6th of April, thinking that the Bosnians, the coalition, Muslim and, and Croat, would capitulate and say, okay, you want to stay within a state, go ahead, Dr. Karadzic, it's yours. But they hadn't read their history. You show people, they get mad. And they get tough. They don't give up. Very rarely has anyone given up. Look at Stalingrad for God's sake. People don't capitulate. And so therefore, it then started to auger in. So it's a, it's a civil war with overtones of aggression. But there's nobody without weapons. There's nobody without weapons in Sarajevo or the rest of Bosnia. There's lots of weapons around there, unfortunately. No, the Serbs have more. The Serbs have more than the Croats and the Croats have more. Let him talk. Please, please. Next question, yeah. Hey, look, look. Look, we don't have audience participation. There's a question. They should be precise to the point. There will be an answer. <coughs> okay, General Kensley, you have stated that you are trying to be as objective and impartial as you can, correct? Okay, I'd like to know, in light of the fact that the United States the United Nations and various humanitarian groups around the world have clearly identified the Bosnian Serbs as responsible for the number, uh, the far majority of atrocities that have been committed. How can you imply that this is an, an even conflict, that all sides are equally responsible? Our own State Department has identified in a report in July that of the 285 cases of documented atrocities, only 18 were uh, said to be done by the Muslim government. Okay, no, good question. Good question. No, no, good question, because everything's polarized. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, reporting is dated. Uh, I wouldn't be too proud watching what's happening these days on the TV, but we'll leave it at that. As far as evenly divided. This is a translation from the Serbo-Croat that I resent because I said in Sarajevo there's more than enough blame to go around. That was subsequently reported and continues to be reported by the Croatian press. Equal blame. I said here tonight, I'll say it again. The Serbs started it. In their mind, let me finish the one part. In, in their mind, there was justification for that. I'm not taking their position, I'm just telling you. In their mind, they will stand and argue why they started shelling Sarajevo. But they bear the majority of the responsibility because they started it. This is really bizarre, by the way, that I say this, and I'm still seen as some sort of a light at the end of the tunnel for the Bosnian Serbs, because everyone else says that they're 100% responsible. What I'm telling you is, they started it. But let, you, let me tell you that of the 19 ceasefires that I brokered in Sarajevo, to deliver food and medicine, to the people of Sarajevo who during my period were not starving, they were hungry, but they weren't starving, bland diet, and there was plenty of medication in the Kosovo hospital until I left on the 31st of July, let me tell you that they broke the vast majority of them, the Bosnian army. Now, I would have done the same thing. I would have maneuvered to improve my position. I mean, we were told for how long that the Serbs had Sarajevo totally besieged. But isn't it funny that two months ago when CNN started reporting the Bosnian army has been sitting on Mount Ingman for the last 17 months, right. the biggest mountain overlooking Sarajevo? I mean, those are the incongruities that you get on television. And by the way, as you probably know, they also sat the Bosnian army doing very well, thank you very much, on the two hills north of the PTT building where I sat for five months. So it's not black and white. Yes, you're victims. There's so damn many victims in Bosnia, it makes me sick when I go to sleep at night. Yeah, oh, 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 I'm telling you, you go there and you walk up to a girl that looks very much like my daughter who has an arm blown off and has blonde hair and hasn't had an aspirin in a month. And as a UN soldier, you deliver food and medicine. You don't question what the ethnic groups are saying. You're doing it for humanitarian reasons. Imagine going up to the German commander of Stalingrad, the besieging German force in Stalingrad in World War II, and you say to him, Excuse me, I know you're killing a lot of Russians in here every day, but I'm from the UN. I'd like to deliver 300 tons of food and medicine to the Russians. Any objections? I mean, you'd be thrown out of this command, you'd be killed. But yet, the international community is doing that. 
a large number of Canadians and 62 other international soldiers have died in Bosnia and Croatia delivering food and medicine. That's the best the international community has been able to come up with. And you're part of the international community. That's the best they've been able to come up with. And we're sacrificing our sons and daughters to do it. And for zero appreciation. Nobody's asking for a thank you. In fact, we stand in the way of intervention. <coughs> so if the world wants to intervene, you tell me how. And I'll be happy to carry the message. It's an impossible military problem. You get yourself in a serious mess over there. Yep. <coughs> I think we met uh, a few months back. Where at? Case <coughs> Western Reserve University. You do remember that you told me that Bosnian government is not after you. Is not after you. Remember when I show you a picture of your friend Horak? Oh, my friend, yeah. <laughs> okay, you remember that? No, I'm afraid. I've done about 300 Couple presentations. Weeks after we met in Cleveland. Yeah. You told me that Bosnian government is not after you. A couple of weeks after, Ayub Ganic was in Cleveland, right. in Croatian beautiful home in East Lake, right. and he said they are still after you because of, because of orgies and raping Muslim women. Okay. That's the fact. Okay. So, so there is no credibility to your speech. Okay. I don't care how you go. Okay, let me answer. Settle down. Settle down. Settle down. Uh, you got your point. That's okay, let's, let's, no talk, credibility. let's talk about, well, it depends whether you believe that it's for me. Let's talk Can about... Can you answer today that my question? Let's talk about the, let's talk about the famous tape, because I was pretty excited about this tape. It was allegedly a tape in Sarajevo with me. Uh, raping a number of Muslim women. So naturally, I was looking forward to seeing the evidence. I've now had it provided to me by the Médecins Sans Frontières, who is in your city of Sarajevo, helping out. It's a tape of me in combat clothing with my arms around four Muslim girls, all of whom are crying. They're the secretaries from my staff at the PTT. They've given me a gift the afternoon before I went back to Canada. That's the tape of me raping Muslim women. Uh, let's go one step further. Have you ever tried to rape anybody when you have four of the meanest French Marine commandos you've ever seen in your life as your personal bodyguards that even go to the toilet with you, let alone let you drive north of Sarajevo where you couldn't get to in a vehicle to go to some camp that I don't even know whether it exists or not, but this I congratulate you. The propaganda is very effective. It's not propaganda. It's your friend Hera that said that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you want me to read that? Yes, yeah, sure, my God I almighty. Hera was being tried for his life as someone who practiced cutting pig's throat so he could... He said you were in his company them. taking those girls from the concentration camps, having orgy, and many of them, they never saw after that. No, no, sir, just ask me one question. Do you really honestly in your heart believe it? Yes. Yes. Do you believe it? Okay. Yes, I do. Then there's, then there's no I hope. got paper here. Don't no, 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 no. You don't have anything. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for speaking the truth and letting the American people know the truth counts and not all the media lies that people believe in because they believe <coughs> lies and they don't believe the truth. And you spoke the truth tonight. Yes. succeed in your speech for two things tonight. One thing to scare the Americans not to get involved yes. in your ambition. One thing. The other thing is you encourage them to change the end in the UN to make it US <coughs> by providing legislation, by giving money, so they have that decision. Like you said, there is three nations now that are ruling the world through the uh, no, security council. Security council. And this is true. Okay, if they need something to happen tomorrow, send through, stop the war in Bosnia, they will stop it. But unfortunately, they are not, none of them they are interested in stopping the war. Okay? I, I, think, I, no, I, think this, I think what's come up here is a very, very good point, is if there is a military solution. I just, let me ask you one question, sir. In the event that you decided to intervene militarily in Bosnia, 
where would you put the force together? Like we did in Saudi Arabia for Kuwait. Where, where would you gather this force together for four or five months to get ready to go? <coughs> it's the last bombing of Iraq. No, no. We, not bomb, we bombed Iraq from Mediterranean. No, but bombing, you can't, bomb you can't win by know, bombing. Do you know where is the concentration for the Serbian forces? They can say couple of bombs. Two other planes, they will go and cut bomb. They give a message to the Serbs. They, will, they know that they are serious. But they are not serious. If they are serious, they, you know, they do it without no casualty. Okay. No American. They okay. lost about maybe fifty million dollars to bomb Iraq from the sea. They won't have to lose fifteen million to uh, to bomb uh, okay. so the Serbian forces. Okay. Yeah, one in front. Okay. Yes, uh, my nephew was a major in the US Marines. He was killed in Beirut by Hezbollah and black fighter group. Why should the United States go and help Hezbollah in Sarajevo against the Serbs who have saved 500 American flyers? Oh, in the But the answer, sir, is the same as, as my country. We take people from all over the world, we send them in the flock, we stir them together. And, 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 and when we say French Canadian or Serbian American, it, it's really the last word that counts. It's because you're American. And, and whether you like it or not, in the absence of a lot of outside support, that is a responsibility that you yourself perceive that you have, and you get drawn into these things. And we've been much better if other people did it. But it becomes an American responsibility. I mean, I'm sorry about that, but uh, and, and the sacrifice that we've all made, and, and you obviously much closer than anybody, is, is part of that process. Because I have a green line, a UN green line through that area right there. I better go to one in the back. You know. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. I can't. Come I'm an active reserve of the U.S. Army. Yes. Now you stated. Basically, the problem. I got this correct that basically the U.S. soldier hasn't got the guts to be the son of a bitch required. No. <laughs> I'm losing command of the English language. You do speak English. <laughs> That's not. Has the American soldier got the guts yeah. to do the right thing to, to run over that person in the in the road stopping the car? Yeah, sure. But if you run over them, then they'll cut all the throats across the hill. Hey, that's okay. Oh. Why <laughs> have <laughs> 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 to uphold the Geneva Convention? No, I, look, I'm a graduate. Even apply in this situation. I'm a graduate of your war college in Carlisle. I know your Thank I know you. your army extremely well, and that's not the point I'm making. I'm saying if you have ten soldiers, why should one of them? be subjected to probably 10 times more risk than the others. Then you explain it to this gentleman here who's lost his nephew. You explain that to him, why his nephew should be sacrificed, nephew should be sacrificed when other nations should be pulling their weight. I mean, you're looking at a guy who comes from a country with half of 1% of the world's population and we're doing 10% of the world's peacekeeping. I want some of those other turkeys to get on board. Not necessarily you. What I want you is to help us out, the UN, with a whole bunch of things you do very well. But doesn't our presence contribute to the problem? Like in Mogadishu, all of a sudden some ill litter. Mogadishu. It's not a helicopter out with us. It's not peacekeeping. Not peacekeeping. Don't confuse it. 33 missions, chapter 6 of the charter. Peacekeeping. Cyprus, Unsol, demobilization of the Contras, uh, those type of things. Korea, the Gulf, Somalia. Somalia is not peacekeeping. It's chapter 7. Let, let me just take a second because so many people don't understand the difference. You all saw the four Marines going down the street in Mogadishu about seven months ago and one of them was hit, Corman, was shot, went down. One of his buddies went to his assistance, the other two guys went up against the building and fired back, probably killed the sniper. Chapter 6, self-defense. You fire that, you can fire back. Now let's say that they took the casualty back to the command post and the Marine Colonel looks down at this individual and says, that's the fourth casualty I've taken in the last two days. Tomorrow at 5.30, gunships, mortar prep, two company attack, I'm taking out that building. Chapter seven, premeditated offensive action taken to sort the situation out. It's a big, big difference. 
and you're doing chapter 7 with the UN's approval in Mogadishu. It's not peacekeeping. Uh, I, I owe one down here. Young man, young man. With the presence of the Croatian HVO in Bosnia and Herzegovina and their self-proclaimed state of uh, Herzeg Bosnia, with the presence of the Croatian HVO in Bosnia and self-proclaimed state of uh, Herzeg Bosnia, and with the uh, JNA having withdrawn, how can there be sanctions on Serbia where there's no sanctions on Croatia, in your opinion? It's easy to answer. Uh, the world likes a black and white situation. The, uh, the Bosnian army that allegedly withdrew from, from uh, sorry, the, the JNA, which allegedly withdrew from Bosnia, didn't really. A lot of them were born in Bosnia, took their patches off, and reported to General Matic and are part of the Bosnian Serbian army now. And they were born in Bosnia. The Croatian army that didn't try to hide it. In May of last year, I believe it was, ran their Croatian flag up in front of the post office in Mostar. It wasn't as if they were trying to fool the world, but there was a momentum that had built up. We like things black and white in North America, Europe too. Black hat, white hat, Western, the whole thing. And the Serbs were the black hat at that stage. You lost, I'm sorry, the Serbs lost the momentum at that stage as far as the PR campaign went. And they covered more of the area, that row, so therefore they were committing more of the atrocities because they had more territory. The Muslims didn't have any territory. They were shopkeepers. They were downtown. When they woke up on the 6th of uh, April, it was time to judge your success by how much property you have. They didn't have very much. They had shops and they taught in the university, etc. The Serbs and the Croats were peasants. Even if they had a PhD, they were peasants. Kolovich always told me, you scratch a Serb, you scratch a Croat, you find a peasant. Doesn't matter what his education is. <laughs> and they had a lot of property. And that's important when you're fighting a war, to have property. So both sides, yeah, both sides deserve a lot of responsibility. And you notice the Croatians over the last couple of weeks are keeping a fairly low profile because all of a sudden CNN's discovered, gee, look what the Croatians are doing. All sides are bad over there. And the biggest victims of the war are undoubtedly the Muslims, because they're caught in the middle. Okay, let's have an impartial question from the back row. Sir. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, the orange club. Are the symbols all the oh,
from your previous conversation here earlier, you mentioned you care about the people over there, correct? Okay, I understand you're having, you're coming out with a book, right? It came, it came, it yeah. came out. Why don't you make a, you know, I think <coughs> both sides here are very happy to donate all those profits and you make them the book with the refugees. Why? Uh, the book is not about Sarajevo only. The book's about 33 years of military service. To, and quite frankly, uh, there are other ways to alleviate the suffering, not the least of which. Maybe I'd like to come to Toronto next week when I'm doing a $10,000 production for Bosnian children and, uh, and Christmas presents and food and stuff like that. Okay? mission in Macedonia might derail the same way that it has gone in Bosnia? If, if the UN and the international community had been able to deploy 14,000 troops as requested in the downtown Sarajevo in March of last year, we probably wouldn't have a situation on our hands that we have now. The 561 Americans, along with the Scandinavian brigade made up of Danes, Swedes, and Norwegians that are in Macedonia now, is money very, very well spent. I firmly believe in preventative deployment. Uh, the problem is you need to be invited. It wouldn't be a bad idea to put a small force in the Kosovo, but you have to be invited. But yeah, I, I don't think it will. I think not only the presence of the UN, but where the UN goes, the cameras go. You ever notice in Bosnia, wherever the cameras are, it's not actually happening. Unfortunately, it's happened before they get there in a lot of cases, or it doesn't happen if they stay there. There are 300 Canadians in Srebrenica with their butts hanging out a mile. The reason they probably haven't been attacked in the last two months is because television cameras are there, not because they're there. So, yes? I'd like to um, hear your talk on this. Having in mind that Bosnia was recognized as a country before it had, and met any requirements. Having in mind it took over a year for this country, my country, and the rest of the Western world to call it by the right name, civil war. Having in mind what you have mentioned up there, that each time the agreement was about just to happen, there was another threat of bombing. It personally appears to me that the most responsible party for the war going on there, as far as it has, is with the President of the, of the United States having accepted the picture of white and black and having, so to say, uh, picked up the sides and the rest of the world following that side because if I was, how is it beggarish? Why should I want to sign when I have a call for intervention tomorrow? I know the people in the area and I personally believe, and I've stated this, that the agreement would have re been reached there within months. As a matter of fact, it was reached in Lisbon. And the agreement would have been reached there uh, within months, if not weeks, if it wasn't for the intervention in the way it happened and for the threats uh, against one side in favor of the other and then hopes of somebody coming in and doing the work for you and delivering to you what you wanted. Uh, please, you, please, you don't, to, don't, don't state that this. What question? The question, the question is that is the, is the United States, is the Western world to blame or no agreement reached by threats of bombing and by giving high hopes that they would intervene on part on one side at the group against the other. Well, it's a factor after the event. The people to blame for the war in Bosnia are the Bosnians themselves. I mean, early, and I'm using, by the way, when I say Bosnians, all four ethnic communities, uh, including the large Jewish community in Syria. Uh, I mean, maybe other people could have stopped it. Maybe other people shouldn't have recognized, and I would agree with you on that. President Zbigniewicz agrees with you on that. Unofficially, he was saying, if he recognizes on the 6th of April, there's going to be war. I mean, he knew it was coming. If there was time required in order for people to have their various guarantees. That's part of the negotiation process that happens in your country and mine. But while I have been unkind in my comments with regard to the American administration, 
I just couldn't ever understand why at the 11th hour it always happened that these threats had to be made. Uh, I don't think it can be, it's not the primary contributing factor. Uh, my own theory for what it's worth is this war has gone through its religious sort of ethnic stages and it's now down to revenge. And that's the very worst <coughs> level it could reach because people are getting eaten now. That's, that's scary. Over here. <laughs> Where? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You are a joker and uh, faceless of that, I must say. The reason I explain this is because, you know, when people are being killed, murdered, raped, and ethnically cleansed, you find the time at the beginning to talk about your appetite, your food positioning, and uh, maybe your health. Yeah, is there a question, please? Do so the money you will receive tonight <laughs> You can make a statement like that, and I can accept it, and uh, and that's for the two of us the end of it. We don't go around killing our neighbor's children because we disagree with it. So I accept what you're saying, and uh, and uh, it, it doesn't require any response. Uh, okay, an intermediate ground here. Yes, sir. Statement to make, just a question. Right. <laughs> costly uh, mission in uh, the Congo. Uh, the UN is fairly gun-shy about uh, peacekeeping missions after that. And um, in light of the Somali operation and the Bosnia situation, uh, I was wondering if, if you had any thoughts on this, uh, especially considering uh, Clinton's remarks to the UN about the UN being more selective in the future about what missions it chooses to take on. Perhaps yes to all of the above. The UN is going to think more than twice before it gets involved in missions from now on. It's had three success stories. The elections in Namibia, uh, an organization that I ran in Central America called ONUCA, the observation force that in fact demobilized the countries, and the recent experience in Cambodia. With all of its difficulties, I think it could be deemed a success. They went there to have a democratic election. The Khmer Rouge didn't want to play, but they had the election. But now, with 60-some uh, killed in former Yugoslavia, over 500 injured, and 50-plus killed, which you have a significant number, tragically, in uh, Somalia, uh, the UN is not going to jump into that. It's interesting who brings the pressure to bear on, on the other side. By that I mean, to be honest, you brought a lot of pressure to bear on the UN during the Gulf War in order to have a moral umbrella from the Security Council for what I personally think, quite rightly, you should have done. There are people here that disagree with it. It was the other way around in Somalia. The UN brought a lot of pressure to bear on you to do what I call subcontracting for them, to do the work for them, and then to hang in there uh, where you are now operating side by side with the UN force. But I think it's been a costly lesson. And I think those folks that wrote the charter in 1945 were pretty smart when they said, don't get involved in civil conflict. Restrict yourself to nice, simple wards of aggression where people are tired and want to stop fighting. I mean, that's the paraphrase. But that was the idea of the And I think maybe they will go back to that. Because there are now, I think, 48 serious civil conflicts going on in the war, world. And there seem to be a few more every day in the old Soviet Union. And the uh, is not rushing to get in. They wanted to send 26,000 troops into Mozambique. They could only get 5,000 volunteers. So they've cut that down to simple observer missions. The observers in Angola, two days ago, were released on the agreement that they would not describe what they saw. They were not allowed to talk to the international community and the press about what they saw, because there are a thousand people dying every day, their bodies all over the street. Sure, yeah. We've, we've stretched the definition of civil war to the limit here. Mm -hmm. We've discussed the various ways that the United Nations has failed in Sarajevo, has failed in Bosnia, has failed in Croatia. As a professional soldier, what do you propose to bring about peace? And I know that there's a lot of things that we don't agree mm -hmm. about, we and you and the buses and everything, but I think we all want peace. I want to be able to go back to Sarajevo I want to be able to walk on the streets. I just want it to be over. How do you propose that that can be done?
to be consistent, when I answer that question regularly, and you're not going to like the answer, and I started saying it about eight months ago, uh, I find the uh, proposed solution in Geneva distasteful to the extreme, but I still think it's the only one that'll work. Uh, I see an open Sarajevo, and I see not fire breaks and fences between three ethnic communities, that's impractical, it would never work, but a general concentration of, of, of the ethnic groups uh, throughout Sarajevo. People would say, that's impossible. Well, we did it in Cyprus, whether you liked it or not, after the Turkish involvement. We still involved. have a UN presence there. Sorry? It's not working there. We still have a United Nations presence on Cyprus. Yes, you do, because in the event that you have a signature in Geneva, the agreement is that the United Nations will put 50,000 troops to oversee the peace agreement. And America has, by the way, a promised 25,000 of those, but the criteria that's been written now, an identifiable end state, a good chance of success, approval by Congress, those qualifying criteria, I got a funny feeling are written in such a way that they'll never be met. But it's a matter for the rest of the international community. I would imagine NATO would commit a fair number of troops there in a true peacekeeping mission. And you and I both know that it would be concentrated on the Muslim population. Because once the Serbs and the Croats decide to quit, there's not a lot of peacekeeping required there. It's required to guarantee some sort of security. I mean, it was tragic to declare safe havens because nothing was done to make them safe. That was just a Security Council sort of uh, statement. It had no validity on the ground because nobody would contribute the troops to make it work. So I'm, I'm hoping for a signature on a piece of paper and a constitutional solution in a three-way split. But if you achieve that signature, you will have Eastern Bosnia with the ability to adhere itself to Serbia. You got it, yeah. You will have Western Herzegovina, yeah. Yeah. which will adhere itself to Croatia, and you will not have a viable Muslim state. So how then can we accept, expect Alija Izetbegovic and the Muslims to agree to such a solution? But don't you think that that is exactly what's inevitable, and therefore you have to create the conditions where the Muslim state is, in fact, viable? I mean, it's at least it's time to get it's inevitable now yeah. at this point because we've allowed it to escalate right. to such a degree that it, it's too late. Yeah. You have to do that. But don't you think the community could make the state viable? Because, I mean, Liechtenstein and, and, and uh, any number of places exist much smaller and, and less of a, <coughs> an economic entity than, than Bosnia. I mean, I don't like the solution. Believe me. I don't like it. But there's so many people that want to put the genie back in the bottle and start all over again. But you got to start from where we are. Sir, you've been trying to I just wanted to make a, uh, a question. Isn't that exactly what uh, President Ali Izabegovic agreed to in Lisbon in 1991, the ethnic partition of Bosnia, if Yugoslavia was allowed to break up, that Bosnia would be allowed to be partitioned according to ethnic <coughs> ethnic boundaries? <coughs> Where did it be? Yeah, except that what he agreed to, and it was a Portuguese brokered plan under, uh, under Culti, Ambassador Cultiaro, was it looked like a leopard spot. I mean, there were ethnic groups all over. What's happened now is in the shift of prop property and the fighting that's going on, there's a Serb area, there's a Croatian area, and there's a very small, small Muslim area in the center, except for Bihak, which is now sort of off, off on its own. But while the cantonization plan was agreed to, uh, it's much... It's much more ominous now because the two chunks, as the lady quite rightly points out, are within two years there's going to be a referendum. That was part of the agreement in Geneva, not yet signed, where they could uh, join on to Croatia and Serbia respectively. Yes, sir. Yeah. I thought I had one question, but since she brought that up, I had two questions. First of all, this is very puzzling to me, I would say, uh, from a neutral party throughout the world. If a Bosnia is looking for a multi-society, multi-group. They had it in Yugoslavia. No, we so after all this trouble, why would you want a, why would you want a, a multi-group with, with what you had? That's the first question. And the second one was, once again, from a neutral party throughout the world looking at the United Nations, uh, when uh, the peacekeepers were bringing in goods and they found those weapons in there, I mean, that was a very disappointing thing to find well, out. Well, yeah, let me address that one first. I know something about it. The question was about the smuggling of weapons. When I went to Sarajevo with 1,600 troops, I also had 100 UNCIFOL, United Nations Civilian Police. 
Every aircraft that went back would land in Sarajevo Airport, the, the ramp would come down in the back, and two policemen, along with a humanitarian representative from Serb, Muslim, and Croat, would stand there while the police checked everything. It then went on to the trucks driven by Swedish drivers, then by Canadian soldiers, and those same RCMP would accompany the vehicle to the distribution point. I mean, it worked beautifully from the point of view of making sure things like that didn't happen. After I left, they expanded it from Sarajevo to all of us. It's like going from Cleveland to the whole state of Ohio plus. And they didn't give the commander there one more police force. Not one more, because the international community wouldn't, couldn't afford to pay for anymore. The UN broke all the time, so they couldn't pay them to win there. And as a result, poor old General Morion is doing what was easy for me, by the way, of checking. He's trying to check the whole schmear in Bosnia. So naturally, there's going to be stuff. There's so much money there, I can't believe it. I mean, the stuff they will offer. Driving out of town, $20,000. Mail this package, $500. Black market like you wouldn't believe. And therefore, there are always people that have big bucks to hand you as a driver, a humanitarian aid driver, to slip some ammunition in there for the folks over in Bootmere or the Serbs up in Gorbachev or whatever. So that as far as how can they pursue what they're after now, that's not for me to say. I deal with reality. The reality of the situation is you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together as far as I'm concerned, and therefore you have to live with the reality on the ground. Now, people say that recognizes force. Unfortunately, when the first caveman picked up a club and stole his neighbor's wife and disappeared, that, I don't like that. But I can't think of another way to do it. The, the people don't give up territory, even if they shouldn't have taken the territory, they don't give it up because of a signature and a piece of paper. You have to recognize the reality. I'm sorry, it would be nice to have a perfect world where you could wave a wand. I don't think it'll happen. So therefore, I think what they're dealing with in Geneva is the reality of where the folks are on the ground. And it's <coughs> this case. Yes. Well, excuse me. I, I didn't mean to say for a solution there. I just meant, I just meant that that's a, that's a, that's a paradox mm -hmm. yes. where you're you, your 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 uh, stand and your stand is that you want a multi group culture, and that's what you had. You left that which you had to get, what you already had. No, I will stop government no, no, because the left is a population. No Muslim minister in the you know, will not government. So we you discriminate to against no, it. I'll, I'll take, I'll take the sorry. military mostly serve. Discriminate against it. Oh, please, please. I'll take two more. Uh, you said. I would like to thank you. Not, people are not ungrateful. I want you to know that all the people of Bosnia, I'm sure, are very thankful of all the help that they receive. Okay? But let's make this trade. Am I correct? My understanding was that all three groups receive the help. Help. Uh, Bosnian Muslims, Croats, and Serbs. No. Go back to your analogy. You said that would be unthinkable you know, in World War II to, to yep. go with the humanitarian help yep. delivered to Stalingrad. Yep. Wouldn't be equally unthinkable to be the German? <laughs> General. They're in Somalia. General. And, 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 and let me just. Let me just elaborate on that, because it's very important to know that from a UN perspective, the mission in Bosnia was more than 100% successful. Now you will find that a shock, but the mandate given by the Security Council was open the airport and deliver food and medicine to the people of Sarajevo, seven aircraft a day. We did 22, because of the UN nation sort of competing to offload the aircraft while they're being shot at. Now, you can say the Security Council failed, and you and I join on that. And you can say the General Assembly failed, and you and I agree on that. But the actual soldiers on the ground, it was a privilege to come in. They achieved their mission. And, uh, and I don't think that should be forgotten. They will do what they're told to do, and they'll do it very well. Sir, do you have a question? Yes. Um, did you yourself, while in Bosnia, receive any death threats? And if so, from what side? Well, it was like a tennis game. <laughs> one, one, two, two, one. 3-2, and when I left, it was about 7-6. So, <laughs> and I got them by fax, which is something new. <laughs> but, 
Let me tell you, I, there's a lot of you here I don't have to explain about the Balkans. The most disturbing death threats by far were when you were called to the Ministry of the Security or Interior on one side or the other, either the official one with the Bosnian government or the unofficial one with the Bosnian Serbs. And they sat you down and played tapes of the other side plotting your death. Because only in Bosnia would you say, now, is it the other side that wants to kill me, or is it these guys playing taste from the other side? They're going to kill me on the way home and make it look like the other side. <laughs> and I've never experienced that. Uh, OK, last question, please, sir. Yeah. <coughs> Mr. McKenzie, I uh, cannot resist the urge to give you the credit and congratulations on two points. One is your attempt to globalize the issue and situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, you get uh, quite good merit on that. The second one is unfortunately excellent and successful uh, presentation <coughs> on uh, avoiding to mention the aggression as such. I was born, raised, educated, and uh, graduated in Sarajevo and lived there for four years. I left in Sarajevo, my friends, colleagues, and uh, relatives in uh, all three ethnic groups. During your, my question, the first question you don't have to answer immediately. <laughs> During your stay in Sarajevo, haven't you found instance or general, uh, of, through your general observation, that in defending Sarajevo, the participating groups were Serbs, Croats, and the Muslims on one side against the aggression from the Serbs overlooking the, from the hills over the Sarajevo, specifically, specifically the Bevich and the uh, Western part. <coughs> that would be impossible, absolutely Please, please uh, get to the point, the question, the question. The question is whether Mr. McKenzie had, had been able to observe that participants in the defense of Sarajevo were all three groups, which would be impossible if they didn't feel that uh, they are all together victims of outside aggression. Yeah. <laughs> Given the chance to be there once again in the same capacity and uh, with your assuming that we, you, we, we, you will allow us to assume that everything that you said so far, not only here today but everywhere where you go, that you are talking in good faith, would you in good conscience do the same, more or less, to alleviate the suffering of people of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay, I've got to keep putting it back in context. Or Sarajevo, remember the mandate was Sarajevo and the surrounding areas, Budmir, Lija, sort of uh, the stoop, Dobrinja. Uh, that's all. That's all the Security Council gave us. We weren't allowed to drive outside of Sarajevo. We couldn't even go to the infamous camps that everyone keeps mentioning north of Sarajevo. Sarajevo, that's it. I saw Syria was shelled. My building was shelled almost every day. So sure, there were people <coughs> shelling. And, uh, and, if, and if that's your interpretation of aggression, yes. Aggression to me is cross-border aggression. <coughs> there were Bosnian Serbs protesting the fact they wanted to pursue their own independence in Bosnia, and they were attacking Sarajevo. Is that your definition of aggression? Absolutely. That's exactly what was happening. 
day in, day out. And I kept running back and forth to Palais and the Presidency trying to get these people to stop it. Because people were dying in Sarajevo. And maybe we did stop a lot of it. Quite frankly, I think we did. We had 19 ceasefires I was there. Some of them lasted almost six hours. <laughs> That's six hours longer than the ones in Helsinki, Lisbon, and London that were brokered by Carrington and, and, and Lord Owen and all those folks. So if you extrapolate sort of five casualties an hour, we saved some people. And that was not our mandate. The mandate the Security Council gave us, your Security Council, led by America, was the best we can do is deliver food and medicine. And we did that in Sarajevo to the tune of 300 tons a day. Now I'm sorry. It didn't stop the fighting. But that's your problem. You got a problem in the Security Council big time. Not the problem of my shoulders. We do what we're told to do. Uh, if I was back there, sorry, not a thing. I probably would have left earlier because I would have lost my credibility earlier. Because I would have been hated earlier. Because I would have been so frustrated with dealing with people that only are interested in talking about the Ottoman invasion in the 13th century, rather than talking about tomorrow and keeping peace. It's a Begovic, God bless him. President It's a Begovic asked me twice, if this was Canada, how would you handle this problem? And I said we'd invite every Muslim and Croat and Serb on television given two minutes, they'd bore us to death in a year, and then we'd have an international government commission study the thing. I mean, that's how we deal with things on this side of the Atlantic. We don't express ourselves by killing our neighbor's children as a priority, not as a chance, not as a, not as a, a casualty by chance, targeting babies, number one choice, old folks number two, soldiers probably third in priority. People that do things like that to each other, I don't understand. I just don't understand. And so, the best the international community has done, let's give them some food and medicine, do what we can. And let's take a bunch of casualties while we're doing it. And that's exactly what's happening. When the Security Council decides differently, soldiers will do differently. Thank you very much, and I guess we should uh, give you a medal as you've been receiving various medals. You've survived uh, salvos from different directions. Uh, thank you very much.